Greetings, folks. I'm Rod Machado. Thank you for visiting my Aviation Learning Center. Can we talk? As a student pilot, are you having trouble learning to flare an airplane for landing? And perhaps you're an experienced pilot who is finding it harder and harder to make consistently smooth landings and, well, find yourself resorting to unusual excuses to explain these sudden impacts to your passengers. I'm speaking of excuses of uh, well, such caliber as microbursts or tectonic plate shifting and even extra strong localized gravity waves in the runway environment. Okay, perhaps I can help you by offering a, a few common reasons why pilots have difficulty with mastering the landing flare. First, if you're a student pilot who's beginning the landing phase of flight training, your flight instructor probably told you to look directly over the airplane's nose as you begin the landing flare. In other words, the round out and flare. So let's think about this. Place yourself on final approach, converging on a tiny runway lying flat on a large planet. As you begin the round out and the flare, the airplane's nose typically rises in your windscreen, blocking your view of everything ahead of you. As you look straight ahead, as instructed, the planet you are approaching at 65 knots suddenly disappears, along with the runway attached to it. Now, this normally evokes a reaction that I call the, hey, where did it go response. Now, how uncomfortable is it to lose sight of an approaching planet while you're still descending toward it? <laughs> Not too comfortable at all. Here's the problem. Your instructor might be providing you with a strategy that he or she uses to land an airplane without realizing that you might not have the perceptual skill to use that strategy. Consider this. When a flight instructor lands an airplane, he or she might indeed be looking directly over the airplane's nose, but he's not looking for what can't be seen, the runway. He can't see through the engine cowling despite his protestations otherwise. Now, what he can sense, at least to a degree, are details in the periphery. That's right, your flight instructor is actually using peripheral clues to the right and left of the nose to gauge his or her height above the runway. Now, while peripheral vision doesn't expand as you gain more landing experience, you can learn to better perceive objects in your periphery with training. And that is exactly what your flight instructor has learned to use and come to rely on to land the airplane. He's learned to use his peripheral vision to aid in evaluating his height above and closure rate with the runway during the landing flare. Now, as a student pilot, you don't have the experience to do that. So, you have to learn to use a different method at first to land because you're unable to use your peripheral vision in the way your flight instructor does. That's why student pilots should use the landing technique that I call the find the planet strategy. Here's how it works. As you begin the round out, you should shift your visual focus to the left side of the engine cowling to a triangular shaped viewing area bordered by the left side of the windscreen, the distant horizon, and the left side of the engine cowling. That's right. You can actually see the horizon to the left side of the engine cowling despite the fact that it disappears when looking directly over the airplane's nose during the landing flare. Amazing, right? The geometry of this area is shaped like a slice of pizza, which I call the domino effect, and in it you'll see the left side of the runway as well as a small slice of the distant horizon. Congratulations, you've just found planet Earth again, evoking what I call the, hey, there it is response. Now your job is to find, then look at a spot on the runway that appears to be stationary. It's the same spot you see ahead of you while driving on the freeway that just loses its blurry features and appears to become stationary because it's far enough ahead of you. Now, at most approach speeds in an airplane, this is typically located at about 80 to 100 feet ahead of the airplane. This non-moving, non-blurry spot allows you to assess your height above and vertical closure rate with the runway. Keep in mind that, perceptually speaking, the non-moving or non-blurry spot on the runway will shift toward you as the airplane slows down. Therefore, your runway focal point moves closer to the cockpit as the airplane decelerates during the landing flare. And this is how you accurately keep track of your height and closure rate with the runway. But there's another problem that most folks don't consider and it involves their 
dominant eye. Now, your dominant eye is not the eye that browbeats the other eye, pun intended. It's the eye that you tend to rely on for precision visual measurement. For instance, when you look through the sighting mechanism of a gun, you typically close one eye and rely on the dominant eye to aim at the target. Now, why is the dominant eye important when learning to land an airplane? Well, let's identify your dominant eye first, and then I'll explain why. Here's what I want you to do. Make a triangle with both index fingers and thumbs. No, this isn't the itsy bitsy spider, which actually starts out like this. And why I know that is deeply disturbing to me and perhaps to you too, but let's move on. Now, stretch your arms out in front of you and with both eyes open, move the center of the triangle to some small object at least 20 feet away. Now, what I want you to do is Move that triangle towards your face while keeping that object centered in the triangle. And as you do that, do you see what's happening here? The triangle has come to rest over the dominant eye. And in my case, it's the right eye, which is not surprising since I'm right-handed. Since 85 to 90% of the population is right-handed, their right eye will typically be the dominant eye. And yes, there are exceptions, but we won't discuss these here. What does eye dominance mean to you when learning to land? Well, it means that you want to ensure that your dominant eye can at least see as much of the runway as your other eye. And that means doing more than a token neck twist to shift your vision to the left. Think about it this way. Baseball players with right eye dominance are taught to rotate their heads to the left a little more than normal when batting to better identify the trajectory, speed, and spin of the ball. If they rely primarily on their left non-dominant eye when batting, then they'll often be heard to say, hey, hey, where to go? As the ball sneaks over the plate. So during roundout, when you shift your vision to the left to look through the slice of pizza, I really need you to shift your vision to the left. Now, don't be a sissy about it. Move it. Twist that head and shift your body to the left as necessary so that your right eye has the optimal view of the stationary spot on the runway. Don't worry. You won't fall out of the airplane. After all, you have your seatbelt on, and since you haven't paid the instructor yet, he will most likely grab you before you tumble out onto the runway. So, you'll be surprised at how helpful this technique is when learning to land an airplane. Since I mentioned that many flight instructors want you to look over the nose during the landing flare, keep this idea in mind. Most flight instructors have a right dominant eye. They are also right-handed, and that means they are naturally disposed to better peripheral visual acuity to the right. Additionally, they have a right hand on the yoke that's naturally trained to respond to these right peripheral visual clues. In other words, while flight instructors feel they can look over the nose to flare an airplane, in reality, they are unknowingly relying on their trained peripheral vision as well as their right eye dominance and right eye hand coordination to actually make their landing assessment. When learning to land from the left seat as a right eye dominant student pilot, you have none of the flight instructor's advantages. And this is why, despite an instructor's good intentions, students often have trouble learning to land an airplane. Now, here's one more thing to consider. Over the years, I've flown with many pilots over the age of 50 who found that they were having difficulty landing smoothly when they've done so consistently in the past. And in many instances, these individuals thought they were losing their airmanship proficiency. A few became so discouraged that they considered giving up flying altogether. Unfortunately, I was able to show them why they are drawing the wrong conclusions regarding their landing difficulty. It turns out that our peripheral vision decreases as we age, along with diminishing pupil size, visual acuity, and so on. An experienced pilot in his or her prime can certainly rely on more of their peripheral vision to aid in landing an airplane. As we age, however, the loss of peripheral vision requires that we return to the strategy used by student pilots when they first learn to land. In other words, we must return to looking through the pizza sliced to the left side of the airplane to properly judge our height and closure rate with the runway. Now, when I've shown older pilots how to use this technique, nearly all were able to dramatically increase the quality of their landings. So those are a few thoughts to consider about learning to land an airplane. And hopefully these ideas will increase the quality of your landings 
perhaps even prevent you from having to, well, convert your airplane's Goodyear tires into a new brand called Maypops or Could Blows. <laughs> I'm Rod Machado. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hello, folks. This is Rod Machado, or at least his avatar. I'd like to invite you to take a look at my new six-hour interactive e-learning course on handling in-flight emergencies. Now, this course covers almost every common emergency that a pilot might experience throughout his or her flying career. And I'm talking about such things as handling split flap conditions, dealing with aileron, rudder, and elevator failure, the six ways to control the pitch when the elevator does fail, what to do when a door or window pops open in flight, dealing with engine fires in flight, wing fires in flight, cabin fires in flight, understanding your airplane's electrical system so that you can handle an overcharging or undercharging alternator, dealing with autopilot problems, what to do when your engine quits, how to ditch an airplane, and how to crash an airplane and survive the impact, to name a few. So, check it out at rodmachado.com.